This is Bishop Gregory Brewer's sermon at the ordination of the Reverend Barrett Kena Smith to the Sacred Order of Priests, January 11, 2014, at St. Augustine of Canterbury Episcopal Church, Vero Beach, Florida. I'm thrilled to be here, and this doesn't get old. People said, well, you've been here for a couple of years now. Does doing these things sort of um, get old after a while? No. In fact, uh, I'm happy at this point to quote the famous preacher, Phillips Brooks, who, in asking a question about familiarity breeding contempt, he said, oh no, familiarity only breeds contempt if you're talking about contemptible things or you're dealing with contemptible people. <laughs> Blessedly, neither is the case today. I've been thinking, and what has struck my thinking about this ordination, and in fact what it means to be a priest, came to mind in a small article I read about Malcolm Blackwell's book, David and Goliath. Because he tells the story of, in that midst of that book about his own kind of rejuvenation in terms of the Christian faith. He was studying how strength, in essence, is made perfect in the midst of weakness, although he didn't quote that scripture. And one of the things, one of the people that he began to talk to was a woman quite elderly who had been a part of the French Huguenot movement in the early 1940s, hiding Jews in the midst of the Nazi occupation. And she talked quite movingly about the commitment that they had made as French Christians, Protestants, to at every point both resist and forgive. It was neither one or the other but it was both, to resist evil and to do all that they could not to cooperate with the occupational Nazi regime, regardless of what the cost might be, including the hiding of Jewish refugees, but also to be quick to forgive, to forgive the persecutor, to forgive, in some cases, the most heinous of crimes, because she and they understood the link, the inextricable link between those two commitments, that it was in fact the power to forgive that gave them the gracious courage and ability to be able to resist. And the ability to be able to resist the evil gave them the fortitude that they needed to be able to forgive. Malcolm Gladwell reports it was the witness and the comments of that woman it caused him to think about forgiveness in an entirely different light. And as a result, brought him back to a long abandoned Christian faith that he had had in his childhood. He had moved to New York City, and like a lot of young people who moved to New York City, they leave church attendance behind. He had been one of those, and it had been a very, very long time since he'd even considered Christian faith. But seeing the witness of that woman, changed his life so that he could write eloquently in that book about his own unashamed now confession of Jesus as Lord and what it meant to be a Christian. I want to say to you, congregation, my fellow clergy, who I'm so delighted here, as well as to bear it, and in fact to anyone considering both what it means to be a Christian, but more importantly, at least in this case, what it means to be an ordained priest, that the essence of priesthood is in fact both of these commitments. The commitment on the one hand to live a life that is in fact contrary to the pervading principalities and powers which occupy and have taken residence in these the United States of America and in fact the earth. And at every point, both to forgive and to speak forgiveness. Because you see, the heart especially of what it means to be a priest is the power and the grace that God confers upon the ordinary for what? For absolution. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. 
Now, any clergy person will tell you, of course, present company excluded, Father Mike, <laughs> that when any congregation gathers together to make the confession as a part of the flow of the service, because God knows our hearts, and I think many of us know each other's hearts, that we can approach that act of confession literally all of the map, but it comes to our personal state of mind. For some of us, on the one hand, it just literally rolls off our tongue. Our heart and our mind are not engaged. In fact, we may be thinking about something entirely other than the confession of our sins. Right? Come on, nod your head. That's true for some of us. <laughs> All the way on the other hand, where we have come to church in part with a certain kind of desperation, because we know in that moment we need the assurance of the forgiveness of God. So it's literally all of us go through the whole gamut at any one point. And more than likely, our experience of church and corporate confession goes up and down. Come on, at least that's true for me. <laughs> and yet, what the priest or the one presiding does not do in the, conf in the offering of salvation and in absolution say something to the, except, to the extent of, now, I know only about a third of you actually mean it, so I'm going to speak to you <laughs> and offer the word of absolution. No, in fact, what the priest does, freely, without restriction, is pronounce that what Cranmer calls most comfortable word, the word that brings comfort, which is, in fact, the complete promise and impartation, not merely promise, but promise and impartation of the forgiveness, not of the priest per se, but of God himself. It's based on the promise that in 1 John, if we confess our sins, God is what? He is faithful. He is just to do what? To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that, the one quote for the morning, Matthew, or afternoon, Matthew Hole, a Brit divine writing in 1715, says this about absolution. The power of absolution consists in the removing of guilt and punishment of sin, and the receiving of the guilty person into favor as if he were perfectly innocent. In other words, the slate's clean. You are justified. It's washed away. There is no longer a record. God, in his infinite wisdom, has chosen in a miraculous moment to literally say, I'm letting go of this one because I'm choosing to forgive you. And that sin is no longer in my bank of memory. I have no idea how omnipotence chooses to forget. How omniscience chooses to say, I will not remember that. But he does. That's the promise of the scriptures. And that is what is being imparted in the word of absolution. I say that's the essence because, yes, what is the other act two more that a priest does? The priest presides at communion and the priest offers his blessing, which the soon-to-be Father Merrick will do at the conclusion of the service this morning. But you see, both of those things are predicated upon the fact that that God, in his infinite love and mercy, has spoken that word of forgiveness to us so that we are, in fact, in right relationship with him and able to receive the bread and the wine and able to receive the impartation of the blessing. So that, at least for me, the word of absolution is, in fact, the foundational act that defines both the character of Jesus and the very nature of Christian. But that word of absolution is more than something that is declared and imparted. It is something for priesthood to be effective that is in fact embodied. Not just it being spoken, but it being imparted into the life of one who out of his innermost being can impart that which he or she has so graciously received. We describe that in the life of Jesus as both power and compassion. The gospel, 
Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, curing every disease and every sickness. For when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You see, it is the forgiving heart that can see, know, and say, and yes, I choose to forgive. It's not ignorant to do so. It is not naive to do so, which would be the accusation of the principalities and powers. How can you choose to forgive such heinous acts? Better to remember, keep the resentment, and never forget. It is the word of Jesus that stands in tremendous strength, strength perceived by the world as weakness. And in that posture, even on the cross, in his own unjust death, could cry out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The word of absolution, even spoken from the cross, it is that profound compassion that, it, that both impels and embodies one who is committed to serving Christ. Because you see, because we are all in that state on any given Sunday morning where sometimes we are in great need of repentance and others, actually it is our nonchalance that is in need of repentance. That the priest chooses to impart forgiveness because regardless of what our conscious mind may or may not be thinking, the heart desperately needs the very forgiveness of Jesus. Because only Jesus, who lived that perfect and sinless life, can give us forgiveness without limit. A forgiveness that in fact, in fact invites us into the very bosom of eternity. And you see, it is that forgiveness that is precisely what the world needs more than anything else. You, you've met them, have you not? The people who have borne more than their share of scars, who in fact have been so wounded that all the only attitude that they can exhibit is a kind of cynical whatever. <laughs> because they really are past deep emotional expression. It's just not within them anymore. They, they, they don't even know how to consider the possibility of forgiveness, both because of what they have done as well as because of what has been done to them. Oh, would there be someone in their lives who would be so moved to compassion that he or she could pray the prayers for them that they cannot pray for themselves, that he or she would weep for them because they no longer know how to weep for themselves, so that the heart would be so softened that hopefully there might come a moment when they would cry out, forgive, and that they could hear the word of absolution, Almighty God have mercy on you. And know the restoration that comes through the joy of eternal life. The prodigal son literally reenacted before I bury it. That is priesthood. It's never about what one deserves. It's always about what God chooses to give the undeserving. Always. Without exception. So, Barry, please stand. As your bishop, as your friend, I give you this charge. Bear within your body the crucible of absolution. Did you hear that? Bear within your body the crucible of absolution. Be one who at great cost, but never as high as the cost of our Savior, chooses to forgive the injustices done to you. For there will be many it's a part of what it means to our God. 
but also to be quick to impart to those who come, whether they deserve it or not, the absolute word of pardon and absolution that is the promise of our Savior. For as you will forgive, as God gives you grace to live into the forgiveness that is yours, as God gives you the grace to impart forgiveness to those who are in need, so will there be a kind of alchemy that happens in your own soul where you more and more will be able to transparently reflect the love of our Savior who always chooses to forgive or as we say in one of the services, whose property is always to have mercy. May God grant you that, that so long as you stand upon this earth, you may be His priest. 